Okay. So I absolutely love Ultimates. Like it's, it's, I think really one of the standout titles in all new, all different Marvel and Marvel Now 2.0. The sad thing is that like not a lot of people know about it or they don't know what's going on in it. And so because of that, they're just like missing out on this amazing stuff. So I'm really hoping this video will serve the purpose of letting you guys know what's going on and you guys will go out and buy it because it is an awesome title. So for those of you guys who are curious about like cosmic Marvel, about like Eternity and Galactus and all that kind of stuff, this takes care of all that. Ultimates covers all that. We've covered all the ultimate stuff up to this point, but it covers all that. But the big question that people have had is who chained eternity? That was the big question. We saw in all new, all different ultimates that somebody had basically put eternity, the living embodiment of the multiverse in chains. Now, what Al Ewing is doing here is actually offering a little bit of a change with regards to the eternity concept. And we'll get to that once we get further into this video, because what we're basically going to get is the origin of everything that's ever existed in Marvel comics from the time the very first universe took form up until the collapse of the multiverse now and what not really what happened but in terms of uh, some of the history of the various different uh, multiverses that have existed in between so it, it'll all make sense by the time we get to it uh, it won't be confusing in any way but the idea here is that we initially pick up with Adam Brashear with Blue Marvel basically just kind of like you know staring into and trying to figure out what's going on with everything because remember the Ultimates basically disbanded during the events of Civil War II when Carol Danvers was using the Ultimates as a way to basically carry out her goal of keeping crime from happening before it happened. Of course, Ulysses and all that kind of good stuff. But because of the fact that, that a lot of people hated Civil War II, <laughs> what, uh, what Al Ewing ended up doing was basically bringing the Ultimates back together to answer the question of who chained eternity. And it was only when the Ultimates had learned this had happened that they began to ask the question of what was going on. Now, from this point, we transition over to uh, over to Monica Rambeau. And the funny thing about Monica Rambeau is Spectrum is that historically, she's played a lot of different roles. I mean, she's been Captain Universe, I believe. Uh, I want to say she was Captain Marvel at one point. Um, but the whole idea here, I don't think she was Captain Universe. I think she was just Captain Marvel. Um, I think it was, uh, oh, I'm, I'm confusing her with the girl from uh, Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. The random chick who was in a car wreck and then suddenly saved by the sentience of the universe and became Captain Universe. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that next year. But Monica Rambeau's played Captain Marvel for a time. And, uh, and the whole idea is that she was always kind of considered to be a throwaway character by a lot of readers in the sense that she never really received her time in the sun. And the cool thing about this is that she actually gets it because what Al Ewing has really been harping on with her character is how powerful she is that she is in effect pure energy that the physical body that we see is not her true form that Adam Brashear looks at her and sees her for what she really is which is basically just pure energy in the form of a human meaning she can basically do anything now we kind of knew that with her character to a degree in the sense that she was able to manipulate all facets of the energy spectrum uh, she could turn into any any form of energy she could use any form of energy that kind of thing but I mean she, she can't like warp reality on a universal scale like she can't manipulate molecules or anything like that she's effectively just a giant battery and so it's really really cool to see what kind of limits her powers can be pushed to but again in the midst of all this uh what ends up happening is monica is basically just kind of whisked away and all of it seems to have been done by connor sims now again connor sims as we know him is basically anti-man of course we covered him during the uh the origin story of blue marvel but he had since been turned into a herald of galactus and the reason why was because galactus realizing that eternity had been chained but not knowing who it was that did it basically said if there is a being out there that can chain eternity, then I need a new herald. And that herald is going to go to the ultimates, bring the ultimates to me and make them my heralds. And so the idea of, of Galactus was to use the ultimates as his heralds, essentially functioning as protectors of the universe, the way it existed now. And that's exactly what happens. The various ultimates are basically whisked away by Connor Sims to uh, Galactus's ship Ta-2. And they're met with uh, America Chavez, who basically says, look, there is a massive, a massive threat coming and we have to find a way to deal with this. Now, America Chavez is one of these characters who's only ever really as interesting as a story that she's in. She's not inherently interesting by herself. Uh, we know this because Ultima, uh, like America number one came out, sold really well, and then America number two tanked. So she's just not really an interesting character. But for what she does here in the Ultimates, this makes her interesting. And that's why I say in Marvel Comics, a lot of the characters are not inherently intriguing. It's the events surrounding them that make them intriguing. For example, Captain Universe is not an intriguing character, but it's Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers that make, uh, make uh, Captain Universe intriguing. The same thing with Starbrand and Nightmask and a lot of those characters, it's the events going on around them that make them interesting as opposed to just the characters themselves. Now, of course, America Chavez being here is basically saying there's something wrong with the multiverse. There's some threat out there in the multiverse that's screwing everything up and we are going to have to try to find a way to essentially fix it. Now, of course, the other half of this is that uh, Galactus and Connor Sims basically take off and they actually end up meeting directly with the Living Tribunal and Master Order and Lord Chaos. Now, the reason why this happens is because of the fact that we'd seen this 
before in the previous discussion of the, the previous videos that we've done, that the first problem the ultimate solved is basically solving all the problems in the universe. The first problem, a major problem they solved was Galactus. They looked at Galactus and they said, him being the devourer of worlds is a threat to all life in existence. What we're going to do is we're basically going to evolve him into his perfect form and make him the life bringer. Now, the reason why Galactus being made the Lifebringer was such a huge deal in terms of the, the contents of this story is that from the perspective of Master Order and Lord Chaos, they represent opposing sides, right? I mean, we've had this, this discussion countless times, and we'll have this discussion again when we basically remaster Infinity Gauntlet and when we do Infinity War and all that cosmic stuff next year. The whole idea is that the universe is basically in balance. There is order and there's chaos, and you can't have one without the other. A perfectly ordered universe would look crazy. A perfectly chaotic universe would look just as crazy. Jim Starlin showed us those two things when we basically went inside the minds of Thanos and Adam Warlock to see a perfect universe in Adam Warlock's mind and a chaotic universe in Thanos' mind. So because of this, they basically work in unison. The issue here is that in the mind, in the perspective of Master Order and Lord Chaos, Galactus is supposed to be the devourer of worlds. That's his role in the universe. That's the role that he plays. In the same way that Master Order, uh, Order and Lord Chaos play the role of two opposites with the in-betweener being the reconciliation between order and chaos in the same way that eternity plays the role of being the living embodiment of the universe and so on, Galactus is supposed to play the role of the world devourer. Now, because of the fact that he's not doing this, they end up invoking the living tribunal because remember, the living tribunal is basically the judge. Whenever there's a cosmic disagreement, the living tribunal is invoked and the tribunal will determine whether or not the actions of a being is or are basically in violation of cosmic order, which is to say, if there were a being that were nigh unstoppable that no one could oppose, then the living tribunal would say this person is not part of the cosmic order. They're an aberration. They're a screw up. That was the whole thing with the character of Protege, who basically copied the powers of everybody that he saw, and it made him virtually godlike to the point that even Protege was able to go again, go toe to toe with the living tribunal. And so the idea here is to basically have Galactus on trial and say Galactus is supposed to be the devourer of worlds. If he's not doing this, he's not part of the cosmic order. He's not maintaining his role. He's going against cosmic law. Ultimately, the living tribunal says no. If this is going to be the case with Galactus, then this is basically his perfect iteration. This is his perfect form. He has moved in the direction, moved into his next stage of evolution. He's not violating any laws. Now, the issue that's made with this is that the Living Tribunal also establishes that because of the fact that the all new, all different Marvel universe and even multiverse is still new, that the cosmic law is still being made. The hierarchy is still being constructed. So for those of you guys who are asking for a new hierarchy for all new, all different Marvel, a new cosmic and power hierarchy, we can't do that yet because we don't know what the hierarchy is. And this plays out when Master Order and Lord Chaos kill the Living Tribunal. Now again, because of the fact that they kill the Tribunal and essentially take his place, what they do in turn is they move on and say, we are going to impose our will, we're going to impose our order onto everything. We're going to make the universe bend to our will. It's going to be how we believe it should be. It's going to function the way that we think it should. Now, in the midst of all this, we end up coming across some sort of crazy enigmatic kind of energy that makes its presence known to the Ultimates. Now, of course, as this energy is fought by the Ultimates, as this energy begins to coalesce, we end up finding out that this energy is the Shaper of Worlds. Now, this is really kind of cool because the Shaper of Worlds is basically a cosmic cube that went crazy. Now, the funny thing about this is that the Shaper of Worlds cannot really do anything on its own. Because it's a cosmic cube, a cosmic cube is basically bound to the intention of the person who wields it. And so it would be like if I gave you a pencil, all right? The pencil can only do what you do with it. The pencil can't draw by itself. The pencil needs you to pick it up and draw something on a piece of paper. And that's how a cosmic cube works. The cosmic cube can't do anything on its own. The shaper of worlds is the exact same way. Now, what the shaper basically tells us is that when it came into existence in the Marvel Universe before Secret Wars, that it basically functioned in all the ways that we saw it do its whole thing, that it would be a villain, it would show up, it would do some crazy things here and there. But when the collapse of the multiverse took place, the shaper of worlds was effectively ushered outside all space and time. And when it did, it saw something out there. It saw a force out there that nobody knew about. And so because of that, it basically confined this confined him down to the to a singular point where it more or less drove him insane but it also made his energy signature you know incorporeal and so what it's been doing is basically reconstituting itself down to a recognizable form which is in uh, you know then in turn harnessed by adam brashear and the ultimates more or less for safekeeping and so because of the fact that the living tribunal has essentially been killed the first step of master order and lord chaos is bonding themselves into the being logos and then to also try to basically force galactus back into being the devourer of worlds in terms of them individual 
individually, they're not able to force Galactus back into the position of being the devourer of worlds. And so for the most part, they launch an attack, but nothing really happens. Galactus just fixes himself and then he calls it a day. But what Al Ewing also does here is he invokes a guy by the name of Jim Tenson. Now, Jim Tenson is a new creation. He's something newly introduced by Al Ewing. And so is a lot of the stuff that we're going to see with a group called the Troubleshooters. And these are basically uh, kind of recruits that have been organized under Jim Tenson for the purpose of operating as like a black ops team or like a recon team and intelligence team. Now, initially, Jim Tenson is contacted by Phil Vaught. Of course, we know him as the governmental li uh, liaison who's been tasked with monitoring the Ultimates. Of course, the reason why the government did that is because of the amount of power the Ultimates possess and the idea that they were basically running around in space without anybody keeping an eye on them. And so what this does is this basically reveals to us that both Phil Vaught and Jim Tenson were part of a group called the First Eternity Battalion. Now, we're not going to learn a whole lot about them, but we're going to learn a little bit more here in a little uh, here in a little while, just enough to kind of give us some context. And that's really about it. And it makes sense just because these are characters that are being introduced. It would really be way too much information if we got origin stories for all these guys over the course of a six issue story. It would just, it'd be way too long. It'd be way too convoluted, way too confusing, and it would throw everybody off. And so we're basically just kind of given this little bit of information about Jim Tenson. But the idea here is that from Phil Vaught's perspective, Jim Tenson, as well as this guy, Simon Rodsvo, which we'll, we'll learn about him here in a minute. Um, the idea is that because the Ultimates are more or less running around with any without anybody keeping an eye on them, and because of the fact that they basically disbanded and then reformed against the wishes of the federal government, the troubleshooters are being sent in to monitor uh, the Ultimates secretly to investigate their base of operations to make sure they're not up to anything nefarious, and to also essentially bring them in and say, you guys are not supposed to be banded together. You guys have to answer to the government in terms of why you're doing this. Now, jumping back to Master Order and Lord Chaos, again, because of the fact that they failed in their attempts to, uh, to, to force Galactus back into his normal state, we end up having Connor Sims whisked away by Galactus as soon as the Living Tribunal died. Basically, Galactus said, okay, things are popping off. Things are going crazy. Get out of here. Go get the ultimates. Tell them what's going on. That was one of the coolest moments was when he basically just kind of whisked him away because that's when you know that things were getting incredibly serious. And that's the coolest thing is because Galactus is such an imposing character in Marvel Comics, such a powerful character in Marvel Comics that when he's with his Herald and things begin to sort of panic, you can almost kind of see him looking at the situation a little fearful and just kind of whispering to Connor Sims, look man, go tell the Ultimates what's going on before things are too late. And like whisking the Ultimate, you know, whisking him away to go find the Ultimate. So it's really cool because it's a great way to show us the gravity of the situation. Now, because Master Order and Lord Chaos were unable to force their uh, their power onto uh, onto Galactus, they travel to the in-betweener. Remember, the in-betweener was created by Master Order and Lord Chaos for the purpose of basically having a balance, a physical representation of the balance between Order and Chaos. But by absorbing the in-betweener into them, and then with uh, with Master Order absorbing uh, you know Lord Chaos into himself, what basically ends up happening here is we end up having a newly for a newly created being formed called Logos. And this is really kind of a cool idea because now what it gives us is a new cosmic entity. And it's actually pretty interesting because the first thing this cosmic entity does is it, is it looks around and it says all these celestials and so on and so forth, they're all aberrations. They're all things that do not need to exist. They're held, they're holdovers from the way things used to be. A new order must be maintained. A new universe has been created and the cosmic landscape must reflect this new universe. And so what happens is Logos obliterates every last one of the celestials, save for one. And the one celestial that is saved is essentially the one above all of the of the celestials. Now, this brings into sharp relief the question of the one above all. How does it function? This is a super simple answer. There's two versions of the one above all. There is the god of the Marvel multiverse, the one that we tried to kill and failed. And then there's the one above all celestial. They're two distinctly different beings. Don't worry. People get them confused all the time. So <laughs> it's cool. Don't don't sweat it if you're kind of a little thrown off by it. You're not the only one. A lot of folks kind of get thrown off by that, but we'll just call him the top celestial just for the sake of keeping things easy. Even then, this is really the only time we see him, but top celestial is basically saved by the Never Queen. Now, the Never Queen was actually a Dan Slot creation as far as I'm aware, and she originally appeared in Silver Surfer, but the Never Queen was really more of like a plot device that Dan Slot made, but because she was established to be a cosmic entity, she's basically been rolled over into 
all the other stories that involve cosmic entities. But the Never Queen basically exists outside of all things that currently exist, and she represents things that could possibly exist. So again, we're really getting, getting into the realm of hypotheticals, so on and so forth. But because of the fact that everything happening in the universe is taking place in the present, she's always one step ahead. She's always in the future. She always represents the possibility of what could be. So the Never Queen is composed of the possibility of you going left instead of going right. The Never Queen is, is composed of the possibility of you waking up instead of dying. She's just composed of all the possibilities that could exist. That's what makes up who she is. So again, it's kind of crazy, but it, but she fits perfectly into the realm of abstract characters. Now, the problem with this is that in the midst of the troubleshooters residing inside the base of operations for the Ultimates, their presence culminates in the Ultimates arriving to see them there. And so what ends up happening is the Ultimates face off against the troubleshooters, and it's kind of a cool conflict to see. It's not wildly significant, but it's cool to see their various counterbalances. But what ends up happening here is Jim Tenson keeps tapping into something called the Psy Force. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what the Psy Force is. We simply just know that it's there. But the big guy who's really important to focus on here is Rotsvo. This guy initially goes against uh, Blue Marvel, Adam Brashear, and then easily overpowers him. And the biggest question to ask here is that if Adam Brashear is one of the most powerful beings in existence in Marvel Comics, then how much more powerful could Rosvo really be if he's going to overpower Adam Brashear in his entirety? So again, what seems to be the indication is that this Rotsvo guy is a guy who's not supposed to be here, that he's someone who's a bit of an aberration. He's a guy that's not what he appears to be. And so again, in the middle of this battle between the Ultimates and the Troubleshooters, Logos returns to Galactus and forces him back into being the Devourer of Worlds. And when I first read this, I was just like, wow, like it blew my mind because Logos is basically like, you're going to go back to being who you were, whether you want to be or not. And so it's kind of this impurity that spilled all over Galactus. And one of the final words he says is, I hunger. Now, the depiction of Galactus as he appears here in terms of how he's drawn is designed to be that way. He looks screwed up. He looks wrong. He looks corrupted. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. That's how he's supposed to appear, simply because of the fact that this is not his normal state. He's being forced back into an artificial state because remember, he basically evolved into his next stage, which was the life bringer, basically the ability to create life as opposed to destroying it. But what also ends up happening here is that Rosvo emerges in the midst of this fight with the Ultimates and basically becomes this sheer wrecking force, absolutely decimating every single member of the Ultimates. Now, of course, Galactus basically teleports back to where everybody's located at, but almost immediately falls. And so what we end up finding out is that with regards to Rotsvo being here, with regards to, you know, all these different things that are going on with Logos, with Master Order, Lord Chaos, all of this has basically been implemented itself by something called the First firmament. And this is when we start to get into the timeline of things making sense. Now, it kind of boggled me a little bit because up until this point in the story, things seem very disjointed all over the place. And it was a good read, but I would rather have had this timeline, you know, at the beginning of the story. That being said, having it at the end actually makes it a little more impactful just because of the fact that it gives us all the answers that we've been looking for all this time. And so what happens is Al Ewing goes all the way back to the very beginning of all things. Now, in Marvel Comics, we knew this was the case, right? Like, you know, before Secret War, you had Marvel, the multiverse, all that kind of stuff. The universe that you think of when you think of Marvel. So when Spider-Man first appeared, when the Incredible Hulk first appeared, Iron Man, all that kind of good stuff. Of course, we had the universe that Galactus hailed from, the multiverse, or I guess really the universe before the current version of the multiverse. And then we had, you know, all these different universes and so on and so forth, dating back to the point when the very first universe came into existence somewhere along the line in Marvel Comics. What we end up finding out here is that this being the first firmament basically created life as the singular representation of the very, very first universe, the Firmament made a group called the Aspirants. What Al Ewing is drawing on here is he's actually drawing on Kieran Gillen, I think it is, his run of Iron Man, which was absolutely amazing. But one of the things that Kieran Gillen established was that at some point in the history of the universe, that there were a massive number of Celestials, but there was a war that had broken out between the Celestials and the Aspirants. Now, we didn't know what the Aspirants looked like. We didn't know their history. All we knew is that they were just some group with power equal to that of the Celestials, and it resulted in the aspirants basically overtaking the Celestials, pushing them to the brink of almost complete and total extinction. In an act of desperation, the Celestials created something called the God Killer Armor. And the God Killer Armor basically obliterated the, the uh, aspirants and pushed them to the brink of all destruction. Now, that is the most recent version of the Marvel Universe. So we'll call that uh, the seventh Marvel multiverse. In this 
first Marvel multiverse, what we're seeing here right now, this is basically just a war that broke out between the Aspirants and the Celestials, which is always destined to do. But in this war that initially broke out, it led to the destruction of that universe. And when the universe was reborn as the second universe, the uh, the first firmament basically spread out. And so what we basically get up to this point is that there was a singular universe with the destruction of the, of the first universe, it exploded into a multiverse. And so with the creation of this multiverse came the cosmic entities that we know them, eternity and so on and so forth. And so because of that, in this, basically this second multiverse, things progressed. The wars repeated yet again, the war between the aspirants, the war between the celestials, it kept happening over and over and over again throughout every single multiverse that was created up to the seventh multiverse, which went into secret wars, which went into the eighth multiverse as we have it right now. But despite all these different conflicts that had happened, the first firmament was always in the back. This energy force was just always in the back watching everything unfold. And the first firmament was plotting its revenge, was plotting its way to basically eliminate all things in existence, retake the universe back unto itself, and then be the sole universe in existence, basically consolidating everything back down. And so because of this, the first firmament began to launch a series of campaigns aimed at basically destabilizing all things in existence and trying to create aberrations that would make eternity extremely weak due to the fact that following the new formation of the universe or the multiverse, eternity was already in a weakened state. So it would allow the uh, allow the first firmament to basically overpower eternity, put it in chains, and then begin the process of destroying everything. Now, the reason why I say that Al Ewing is basically going through and offering changes is because historically speaking in Marvel Comics, eternity was the physical representation of a universe. And so there were an infinite number of eternities, one for each universe. The idea had been toyed with that there was a singular eternity that made up the multiverse, but there was nothing to indicate that it was actually true. What Al Ewing is doing here is making it true. Al Ewing is saying now, there's a multiversal eternity. There's one eternity that represents or is the physical embodiment of the multiverse. Inside that multiversal eternity are all the infinite number of universes and one eternity for each of those universes. So again, it's a little interesting, you know, at the very least, but again, it basically expands the Marvel cosmology. Now, of course, switching back to the conflict as it exists right now, of course, what we end up doing is we end up having Connor Sims basically resurrected by the combined efforts of Monica Rambeau and Adam Brashear. And so because of the fact that Connor Sims is brought back, uh, Connor Sims basically containing what's left of the life bringer energy essentially takes himself directly to Galactus and merges himself with Galactus to a degree in the sense that he disperses himself into Galactus. As a result, Galactus is reborn as the life bringer and then destroys Rotsvo and in doing so learns everything that Rotsvo knows, which is basically the first firmament. The idea that this first firmament has struck first, that this entire event, everything we've seen up to this point is the first battle. It's the opening salvo. It's the first skirmish and the first firmament intends to launch a massive campaign against the entire multiverse, destroying essentially everything and bringing all things into existence back into itself and then being a singular universe unto itself going forward. But anyway, if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. I love Ultimates. It's definitely one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite stories up to this point. It's pretty stellar. Like I love the cosmic stuff though. So anyway, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.